everyone. Thank you so much to, for being here. This is our workshop advocating for self. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, we wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. So UCSD resides on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. The UCSD community holds great respect for the land and the indigenous people that first resided where we are currently located. Furthermore, we want to acknowledge that the Kumeyaay people continue to have political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge and continue to amplify and uplift the Kumeyaay Nation for their contribution to the UCSD community and the greater San Diego area. And this statement was adapted from the UCSD Intertribal Resource Center. And if you're currently tuning in from somewhere not in San Diego, um, feel free to check out that website that says native-land.ca and you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you whose indigenous territory you're occupying or you can scan the QR code. So we had a second part to our land acknowledgement today. On the map to the left, you'll see approximately what the Kumeyaay Nation's territory used to look like. It was an expansive region that bordered the ocean and pre-existed the border wall. On the right side, you'll see what the reservations today look like, um, which are all really far east and very far away from the ocean. And I wanted to share this with you all because it really speaks to the displacement of indigenous, indigenous folks such as the Kumeyaay. Um, Kumeyaay actually means those who face the water from a cliff. All right, so we wanted to go ahead and do some introductions. I'll go first. My name is Risa. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a social justice educator, as well as an outreach and engagement intern at the Cross Cultural Center. And my major is political science with a focus on public law. Hi, everyone. My name is Camila. I use any pronouns, and I'm a social justice educator, as well as one of the Joy de la Cruz art and activism interns here. Um, I'm a sociology major with a concentration in social inequity. All right, so an overview of what we're gonna be going over today. First, we're gonna talk about self-advocacy basics. Then we're gonna move on to barriers to, elf, to self-advocacy. And then we're gonna go on and talk about boundaries and then next communication. And finally, how to advocate for yourself. All right, so in this section, we're gonna be talking about the self-advocacy basics. And I have a discussion question to start us off. Can you think about a time when you stood up for yourself? How did you feel? And make sure to put your chat, um, to set the chat to everyone so we can all see what you have to say. Um, while you all are thinking, um, I can talk about an example. Uh, one time, I was waiting in line in Santorini here in Price Center and the person behind me was standing a little bit too close to me like they were definitely in my personal space and so my first instinct was to try and move and unfortunately they moved with me I'm assuming they thought I was like moving forward in line um, and I tried it a few more times and they really were not understanding that they were in my personal space so I turned to them and I told them, hey, can you move out of my space, please? You're standing too close to me. Um, and although it was really uncomfortable and really nerve wracking in that moment, the result was exactly what I wanted. They apologized um, and stepped back and I was able to order my food without feeling so uncomfortable. So that's just an example. So feel free to share your own. Someone said in the chat, I had to advocate for myself being a women's wrestler in high school. Definitely. No one has anything else to add. We're gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right. What is advocating for yourself? So the definition of an advocate is one who defends or maintains a cause or proposal, someone who supports or promotes the interests of a cause or group, or one who pleads the cause of another. And there are three components to self-advocacy. One, understanding your needs. Two, knowing what kind of support might help. And three, communicating those needs to others. And so what, are, what might self-advocacy look like as a college student? It could look like going to office hours and speaking to professors. It can look like raising your hand to ask a question. It can look like asking for extensions when you need them. 
Um, it can even look like asking for space or for time alone from your suite mates. And it can look like scoping out the old student center for possible resources like the food co-op, the basic needs hub and more. Um, another thing about self-advocacy is that it's learned in small steps. Um, someone may start with just understanding one of their challenges and they might be able to say that something is wrong, but they might not be able to communicate what kind of support they need, but that is okay. There's, you learn in baby steps. All right, so now we're gonna watch a short 49 second video about what exactly self-advocacy is. Get for yourself means to boldly say what you need, want, and hope for in this life. To be an advocate for yourself means to have the courage to express how you feel, but do it in constructive ways. To be an advocate for yourself means to ask questions, even when you think the answers are obvious. To be an advocate for yourself means to admit mistakes, but make a commitment to learn and improve upon each mistake. But most importantly, to be an advocate for yourself means to stand up for yourself and others in the face of all injustice. Please be an advocate for yourself because you can't expect anyone else to do it for you. All right, so why is self-advocacy so important? It helps us learn more about our own strengths, weaknesses, and needed accommodations. We can develop resilience and build up our confidence, and it helps us improve our communication skills. And it teaches us all those skills so that in the future, if we need to request accommodations in the workplace or in higher education, we can do so. And speaking specifically about students um, and learning, it, it enables students to get the needed modifications and accommodations so they can show their true abilities and reach their academic potential. In general, self-advocacy is an opportunity for us to get to know ourselves better. We learn our own boundaries through practicing self-advocacy. For example, as I have learned to advocate more for myself and my learning style this year, I learned that I actually prefer hybrid learning and teaching over just being fully in person or just being fully online. And that's because I'm more of an introverted person. Um, and so being fully online was a little bit too isolating for me, but being in person was a little bit too overwhelming for me. So now when I look for classes, I know what to, what to look for and what to request. And all this to say that you learn through trial and error. And I'm not saying that it's easy or comfortable to advocate for yourself, but in the end, you're going to be setting yourself up for success. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the barriers that can come up with self-advocacy. And we wanted to start this section off with another discussion question. Uh, so again, feel free to put your answers in the chat. Just remember to set the chat to everyone. And this question is, what makes it difficult to advocate for yourself? And again, while y'all are thinking, I can share my answer. Um, I, yeah, I think oftentimes someone said in the chat, scared of confrontation, judgment from others. Those are absolutely things for me personally. I totally agree. So many responses in the chat. Anxiety from the other party's response, judgment, the idea of being scolded, thinking of the negative or aggressive reactions the other might have requires vulnerability. Absolutely. Not knowing what I want, being considered different. Definitely, there are all of these things that come up when you ask for help and when you ask for what you need that can be really scary and challenging things uh, that can make advocating for yourself difficult. Thank you so much for your responses. We'll go ahead and move on. So I want to talk first about some of the barriers that, self that can exist to self-advocacy uh, in the realm of social justice. Uh, so looking at the role of oppression in self-advocacy, first I wanted to go ahead and define oppression. Oppression it can be defined as interlocking forces that create and sustain injustice. So there can be oppression based on gender, based on race, based on sexuality, based on physical ability. And so these different aspects of your identity can determine whether or not uh, you face oppression in different areas. Now, experiencing oppression is something that's very difficult and 
can be very detrimental and harmful to you. It can even be a form of trauma. If you're experiencing this negative messaging and these negative uh, experiences again and again, uh, this can have a really difficult and really detrimental effect. And I, you know, as I just mentioned, there is this constant negative and harmful messaging that can then lead into internalized oppression, which means internalizing oppressive views such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and more, you know, believing that these views are true and making them a part of how you see yourself, making them a part of your self-image. And this can lead to you believing that you're not worthy and that you shouldn't advocate for yourself because you're believing this negative messaging and that you're hearing from society, from the media, sometimes even from friends and family. So that tends to be more of an internal barrier to self-advocacy, but there are also more external barriers that uh, exist as well. And these are things that tend to be more systemic that get in the way of you getting the things that you need. So for example, many social and economic systems are set up to disadvantage people in certain groups. So people in marginalized groups may not have access to the same resources or options that people in privileged uh, groups have access to. And so because of these systemic barriers, it can be difficult to find and get the resources that you need when you're trying to advocate for yourself. All right, so I wanted to examine self-advocacy through another lens and how we can think about self-advocacy as a form of social justice. So self-advocacy is a form of self-care. And what I mean by that is that self-advocacy is a way of taking care of yourself. It's a way of making sure that your needs are always going to be met. Um, and there's actually a saying that goes, self-care is resistance. Um, and taking care of yourself is a radical way of combating oppressive systems like capitalism. Um, and self-advocacy is also community advocacy. So when we advocate for ourselves, we are also advocating for others. And what I mean by that is that when we advocate for the well-being of our community, we are thereby advocating for our own well-being. Um, and that kind of goes with the principle of our own liberation being intertwined with the liberation of everyone else. All right, so next I wanted to speak a little bit on boundaries because boundaries I think are a very important part of self-advocacy. There's something that we hear talked about a lot. So we wanted to go a bit into what boundaries are and how they can play a role and how to set them. So we'll start off with another video. This is called How to Set Boundaries, Get Smarter with Blair Amani by Blair Amani. And I'll be playing just one clip of this video right now. And this clip will be a little over a minute long. Boundaries are the rules and guidelines that we set for ourselves and others in interpersonal interactions or relationships. I'm generally pretty good at setting boundaries and that's because probably my parents are like very into mental health and the idea of like, you know, bodily autonomy. Those things are very important lessons to know. But it's also important to understand that not everybody is able to set boundaries equally because we have systems of oppression. Systems of oppression dictate everything from power dynamics to politics politics of human interaction, the politics of literally who has access to power and resources. There's also things like sexism and racism. I mean, think about how many black women are often the ones to have to say, don't touch my hair. Because of racism and the idea of bodily autonomy not belonging to black people or racialized people, often having to say, don't touch my hair is an extra layer that black women have to set, and not just black women, but black folks of any gender identity. Another thing we see is with pregnant people. Don't go touching pregnant folks' bellies. That's a boundary that we should be able to set. That's so weird, y'all. So let's get into boundaries and those personal rules and guidelines that we have and why they're important. Yeah, so as they mentioned in this video, boundaries and oppression really go hand in hand uh, as with self-advocacy and oppression and social justice, as Camila was just talking about. It's important to recognize how these things don't exist separately, but they interact with each other. 
So now I wanted to talk a little bit about why boundaries are important. Healthy boundaries are super necessary for self-care. And as Camila was talking about, self-care is a crucial thing and it's a form of resistance. Boundaries are what allow us to care for ourselves because they're what allow us to communicate our needs, uh, what we need to be able to be happy and healthy and feel safe. And when we don't have boundaries, when there's this lack of boundaries, it can result in a negative experience. Uh, it can result in us feeling taken advantage of. Maybe someone asks too much of us because we have difficulty setting a boundary with them. Maybe we feel hurt as a result of not having boundaries uh, because once again, someone might do something that makes us feel unsafe or uncomfortable. And not having boundaries can also result in burnout. Burnout is a state of emotional and often physical exhaustion that causes someone to feel unmotivated and hopeless. And so when you don't have these boundaries, uh, you can get to a place where you feel like you're always, uh, lines are always being crossed or people are always asking too much of you. Uh, you're always in positions where you feel unsafe. And so in boundaries are super important to be able to ask for what you need and make sure that you're in a place where you're feeling happy and healthy. Of course, setting boundaries like self-advocacy in general isn't easy. Uh, as y'all mentioned in the last discussion question, there can be lots of different feelings that kind of come up when advocating for yourself or setting boundaries. There can be guilt. Maybe you're told, you've been told that you shouldn't set boundaries, that it's not something you deserve or it's not something that's okay to do. Um, and that can also result in feelings of shame. As people mentioned in the chat also, fear is another thing that can come up when setting boundaries. Maybe you're afraid of how the other person will react or uh, the being vulnerable, which uh, again is a scary thing. Uh, but it's important to remember when setting boundaries that boundaries aren't necessarily about other people. They're not about being rude to others or doing something mean or malicious. Boundaries are about holding respect for yourself and doing what you need for yourself. So now we have another video and this one is the second part of the first video. This will be around three minutes long and this will be focused on how to set boundaries. Let's learn how to set boundaries and how to reinforce them. Setting boundaries is so important and yes, it can be awkward or kind of clumsy as you get used to doing it, but you're building the processes in your mind about how to do it. That's how we get better at something through practice and also determining that we can honestly say that we set boundaries on a regular basis. Boundaries can look like blocking somebody on social media, saying no, telling somebody your food allergies, things that are literally life and death, but it can also look like telling somebody you don't want a spoiler. Now, spoilers, for those who aren't familiar, are things that will spoil a TV show, a movie, or a piece of media. And when something popular comes out, we're generally pretty good at being like, hey, no spoilers, and even asking, hey, have you seen that show yet? I don't wanna give you any spoilers. Oh, no, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, okay, then I won't give you any spoilers. Like, we do that very often. But when boundaries relate to things like our personal autonomy, physical space, and when those things connect to power dynamics and even systems of oppression, sometimes it becomes harder to set boundaries. But let's walk through some various different ways of setting them. The first one is basically letting somebody know how you wanna be treated or not. I often do this. Sometimes I'll get people asking me inappropriate questions and I'll say, hey, that question's inappropriate, I'm not gonna answer it. Boom, but I'm also in a position where I'm able to set those boundaries and not face the consequences of them. In different situations, like for example, being catcalled, you're hard pressed to set a boundary with somebody who already is dehumanizing you by yelling at you across the street. And then you're supposed to say thank you or feel validated or feel more attractive because you're being harassed. In that circumstance, say whatever one liner you need to get out of that situation. When you can't set a boundary, it's not your personal failure. It's because we live in different power dynamics, different systems of oppression that prevent us from being able to tell others how we want to be treated. Another way of thinking about boundaries is decolonizing human interaction. That's something that Dr. Shea Kill McLean talked to me about. And so when we decolonize those human interactions, we're basically rewriting the scripts that have been written by European colonizers and dictated how we should and shouldn't treat each other and writing those on our terms. 
Not everybody wants their pregnant belly to be touched. Not everybody wants a hug. Not everybody wants a handshake. And we should make sure that we're asking about honoring people on their terms, not on ours. Because yes, the golden rule says treat others the way you would want to be treated. But the fact is we should treat others the way they want to be treated. That's the key. And personal boundaries allow us to do that. How to set boundaries. Number one, know yourself and reflect on what you want and need from an interaction or relationship. Number two, practice expressing your personal guidelines or boundaries. Number three, express your boundaries. Number four, remind people of your boundaries if possible, if or when they are not respected. And number five, respect your boundaries and the boundaries of others. All right, so now we have another discussion question for y'all. And this one says, what are some examples of boundaries, either in your own life or that you've seen? I can give my answer here. One boundary that I sometimes set is I'm not the most touchy person. I don't necessarily like being touched. So sometimes I'll tell family members if they try and give me a hug, oh, I don't want a hug right now. Thank you. Like, I'm happy to, you know, chat with you. I just don't feel like giving you a hug right now. So that's a boundary that I sometimes set. I can also share a boundary that I've set in my own life. So I mentioned earlier that I'm a little bit of an introverted person. So something that I do is when I feel like my social battery is up, I'll literally just communicate that to whoever I'm hanging out with. I'll, I'll tell them, hey, like I'm having a lot of fun hanging out with you, but my social battery is kind of up. Like, is it okay if you go home soon? Do you need me to drive you home? So yeah. Someone in the chat said, I go to sleep and prioritize my sleep even if I still have work to do. I think that's a great boundary, making sure that you set boundaries between schoolwork and getting rest and taking care of yourself. Absolutely. Someone else said, I don't entertain conversations with people when people come up to my door to solicit something by telling them, I'm sorry for interrupting you and I'm not interested and don't have time at the moment for this. Sometimes I'll have to do that when I'm late to class or something and people come up to me on library walk and I have to say, I'm so sorry, but I'm late to class. I can't talk right now. That's another example of setting a boundary that you do pretty often in daily life. All right. Well, thank you so much for your response. Oh, we have one more. Sorry about that. I feel like a boundary that I've set is that if I'm not familiar with, I would reject people touching me. And yet, but yet if I'm really familiar with a person, I would be all touchy touchy with them. So yeah, deciding who you feel comfortable having physical contact with and deciding who you maybe don't. Someone else said generally giving handshakes, especially in meeting someone, especially since COVID. Absolutely, yeah. Boundaries about who can touch you in your personal space are all absolutely boundaries you can and should set. Someone else said setting a boundary at a club by making it clear that I'm not interested and that I don't wanna be touched. Absolutely, yeah. These are all great examples of boundaries. Thank you all so much. Uh, feel free to keep putting your answers in the chat and we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, so in this section, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about communication. So to start off, why is communication so important? First, it enables us to pass information to other people and to understand what is said to us. In interpersonal uh, relationships, communication is so important to try um, to understand what the other person is saying and feeling, and then being able to respond to what they're telling you in a way that shows that you are trying to understand what they're saying and responding in a way where you explain your own thoughts and feelings in a clear manner. And communication is also really important in the pursuit of social justice and in the creation of solidarity. Um, and this is because when we communicate effectively with each other, we are making sure that all of our content is accessible. So um, for example, in this presentation, we're using closed captioning services. And that is on, uh, that is us trying to make this information as accessible to you all. And if everyone communicated effectively, we can prevent burnout and ensure that everyone is taking on a just amount of work and that people are not um, taking on too much uh, or yeah, taking on too much when they don't have the time to. All right. So 
In this slide, we're gonna be talking about a step-by-step -step process of how to communicate your needs effectively. Um, the first step is to feel or to prepare for the conversation that you're going to have. A lot of times these type of conversations can be uncomfortable and that's totally okay. Um, and so going into conversations such as these, the hope is that you're giving someone the opportunity to engage in a conversation that will hopefully further or deepen your relationship. And in order for that to happen, you need to ask yourself, what is it that you truly need or want? And making sure to be specific about what that is and what that looks like. So the next step is to pick, to pick an appropriate time. So making sure that neither of you are super busy or have a thousand other things on your mind. Um, and then, so getting in to... Um, that conversation. When you start it off, you want to start off by praising the other person. And so start the conversation by sharing something that the other person does that makes you happy or that you appreciate and would like for them to keep doing. So let's say that I have a friend who engages in a lot of online activism and they repost a lot of upcoming protests or informational blogs, but I never really see them in person or calling out people in their own lives. And so this is just the example I'm going to, to use for the sake of this slide. And so praising them could sound like, I really appreciate it when you repost the protest that I post on my social media. So moving on to feel. So focusing on how you feel first, and that can look like using I statements and making sure you speak on your own experience and not on the experience of others. So in the example that I provided, I would say, so first I would praise them. I would say, I, I really appreciate it when you repost the protest that I post on my social, social media, but I feel upset that you are never actually there. And then you would state why. So I could say, I feel upset that you're never actually there because it feels performative. And so once you state why, make sure to clarify your need. Um, and so in this example, it could be, it's really important to me that we are able to show up for our community together and not just online because your physical support in the form of being present or through mutual aid practices is just as necessary for the movement to progress. Plus, I would really enjoy your company. And so once you clarify your needs, this is your opportunity to request or invite. So make a request or invite them to solve the problem with you. So this is the part of the conversation where you would both discuss what is in your own capacity and what's non-negotiable. And so in the case of this example, that could look like asking your friend, would you be willing to come to the next protest or can we talk about what it would look like for you to show up more frequently? And then finally, ask them if there's anything else that they'd like to say. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say? I'm listening. And so that's just a step-by-step -step guide and I ran you all through that example. Um, obviously, that's just one example, but you can use this, um, this method for any sort of issue that you want to communicate um, or feeling that you want to communicate with anyone else. All right, so now I wanted to go a little bit more into specifics of communication, and we'll start with asking for help. Now, like all of these things, asking for help can be something that's really hard, really difficult to do. Uh, I know for myself personally, I sometimes find it difficult to ask for help. Um, and this can be for a lot of different reasons. One possibility why asking for help is so hard is because of fear. Uh, once again, you may not be sure how the other person is going to respond. And by asking for help, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position, which is scary. Additionally, Asking for help can be difficult because sometimes it's hard to articulate exactly what you need. Sometimes you might know that you need help or know that a need of yours isn't being met, but it's difficult to say exactly what you need or exactly what help is going to be most beneficial to you. So these are all things that we can practice and get over this uh, difficulty of asking for help, absolutely. Uh, the first thing I think to note is that you deserve to get the help that you need. Um, I think sometimes there can be this idea that we need to do everything independently and we should do it all on our own and we shouldn't need any help. In reality, this isn't the way that we can operate most effectively. Uh, when we lean on our communities and lean on other people, we're able to meet our needs better and to function better. Um, 
individually and as a community. And I think um, oftentimes this idea of individuality can sometimes go too far and lead us to not feel like we're able to ask for help. Um, and so when asking for help, knowing that you deserve to get the help that you need can help you be confident in asking um, and understanding that this is something you deserve. So you should be confident in asking for it. Uh, another important part of asking for help is thinking about who you should ask. Uh, sometimes it can be difficult to know who can best help you. So take the time to think about who can best meet your need. Uh, sometimes it's super clear, like you need to ask a professor for an extension uh, or help on studying for a test, but sometimes it can be less clear about who best can help you. So definitely take the time to think about how your needs can best be met and who can do that. And also I've included here some other tips in asking for help that can be beneficial. The first of these is being clear and specific. Make sure that when you're asking for help, you say exactly what you need so there's not a chance of miscommunication and therefore you can get exactly what you need. Being as clear and specific as possible will help meet those needs and get you the help. Also talking face-to-face -face, if possible is super beneficial. Of course, sometimes this isn't possible, but when you can, talking face-to-face -face can be great. Uh, not only because it helps with communication and uh, reduces the risk of a miscommunication, but also it's been shown that asking for help face-to-face -face, uh, makes it more likely that that person will help you. And then finally, of course, once you've asked for this help, say thank you. Appreciate the person who has taken their time to give you some help, uh, and that'll help you know further build that relationship and allow you to both help each other in the future. Another aspect of communication that I wanted to discuss is over apologizing. And this is something that I do often that I'm still working on. And I know a lot of people who do it. So over apologizing is saying sorry when you don't need to. It's saying sorry for something that wasn't your fault or that doesn't necessarily need an apology. So for example, before I've apologized in class for asking a question, I'll be like, sorry, I just have a quick question about X, Y, Z. And that's not something I need to apologize for. Uh, asking a question doesn't require apologizing. You didn't do anything wrong. Uh, so recognizing that that's a situation of over-apologizing. Now, over-apologizing is often a result of social conditioning for marginalized groups. Uh, and this can appear in three main ways that I've outlined here. The first is due to people-pleasing. Uh, certain groups are taught that they need to appease others. Uh, we see this often in marginalized groups, uh, and oftentimes women especially are taught that their job is to please other people and to make sure that everyone else is comfortable. And so that can lead to over-apologizing and feeling as though you have to apologize for taking up space or for doing any small, minute thing incorrectly. Additionally, low self-esteem can play a role. Uh, as we talked about before, internalized oppression is real and it's an issue. And marginalized groups can sometimes feel that low self-esteem as a result of internalized oppression, which can result in over-apologizing and feeling like you have to say sorry for uh, the most basic things. And another uh, part of this is perfectionism. Uh, now, this isn't necessarily specific to marginalized groups. However, there can be the model minority myth uh, that certain minorities or certain marginalized groups need to uh, live up to certain standards and that can lead to over apologizing or simply feelings that you have to be perfect. You have to exemplify your marginalized group uh, perfectly and that can result in over apologizing for any sorts of mistakes or anything like that. Additionally, uh, once you've been conditioned into this, over-apologizing can become a habit. It can be something that you do without even realizing it. Uh, sometimes I'll apologize and my friends will be like, what did you apologize for? And I won't even really know why I apologized. Uh, so it can become something that's habitual and you get into routine of doing. Uh, so it's important to break that habit. 
when thinking about apologizing, although there of course are things you need to say sorry for, you don't need to apologize for certain things. You don't need to apologize for things you didn't do or can't control. You don't need to apologize for your feelings or needing help or taking up space. Uh, so ways that you can work on over apologizing and work on saying sorry so much is first noticing when you apologize. Uh, sometimes with my friends, uh, one in particular will stop me every time I apologize. And so that helps me make like a mental note of I just said sorry. Why did I say sorry? Was it necessary there? Um, and it lets me ask myself if apology is really necessary. And then if it isn't, I can rephrase and say what I said differently. Uh, another part about rephrasing is sometimes when you're in this cycle of over apologizing and it becomes a habit, a one way that you can work on not apologizing so much is to instead say thank you. So for example, if you have to change the time of a meeting because something else came up, instead of saying, I'm so sorry, I have to change the time of this meeting uh, and you know, over apologizing, you can instead say, I have to change the time of this meeting. Thank you so much for being accommodating. Uh, and rather than apologizing, uh, it recognizes the other person and appreciates them uh, while not putting so much blame on yourself. If I can butt in really quickly. Um, also, when it comes to like over apologizing and let's say you notice that one of your friends over apologizes a lot, um, I think the best way to go about that instead of like telling them, oh, you don't need to apologize for that because normally that will lead to them apologizing for apologizing too much. Um, like what Risa said, um, you can ask them why they apologize because that will make them step back and be like, oh, like I didn't really need to apologize for that. So being mindful of the way that you call people out on over apologizing. Absolutely. That was a great point. Thank you so much, Camila. All right. So this is a quote from Ann Lamott that I wanted to uh, put up here and it says no is a complete sentence. Um, so first a little bit of background on Anne Lamott. Uh, she's an activist, a public speaker, and a writer. Um, and I think this quote is important because I think we're often taught that we can't just say no to something. Uh, and we need to learn that it's okay to say no to something. Uh, in fact, saying no is sometimes something that you need to do. Uh, you know, it's not just okay, it's something that you should be doing. Uh, and again, what's important about this quote, in addition, is that it shows that you don't necessarily have to explain yourself when you say no. Uh, oftentimes we feel like we have to justify why we don't have the time or energy to do something or why we don't want something, um, why we, uh, excuse me, um, we feel like we have to justify saying no and that we have to have a good reason um, to like to rest. Um, and that's not the case. You deserve to do what feels right to you and you don't owe others that explanation. So in this section, we're gonna be talking about how to advocate for yourself. And we're gonna start off by watching a short two and a half minute video um, that explains all the steps that you need to follow in order to advocate for yourself. Learning to self-advocate is critical to fostering independence and success. Self-advocacy is something you already do. When you ask a teacher for assistance, when you speak up for yourself, when you get help from a parent or a friend, you're self-advocating. What is self-advocacy? Figuring out what you need to be successful. Why is it important? People of all ages and backgrounds are more successful when they self-advocate. They learn more, do better in school, and over the course of their careers. As we discuss what you need to do to be your own advocate, you'll find that there are really only five steps. Step one, identify and clarify. What's the problem? What do you need? Be clear and specific about what you require. It's easier for someone to provide a solution when they know exactly what the problem is. Step two, select. Who is the person best suited or in a position to help you with your problem? Asking the right person is as important as identifying the problem. 
The right person should be reliable, trustworthy, and have the knowledge or expertise you need to assist you. Step three, confidence. Don't be scared to ask. You're asking for yourself and you are important. Don't hesitate. On the other hand, don't use misplaced pride as an excuse not to ask for help. It can be difficult, but it's the best thing and you will benefit. You will have to practice asking for support and challenge yourself to be the best. Step four, speak up. You know how and you know what you need. Make your voice heard. Ask for help. Be specific about what you need and be polite, not demanding. Step five, thank you. Say thank you. It's polite, professional when someone does a favor to say thank you. It's also a pleasant reminder in case you ever need their help again. This step you'll find more critical as you move from high school to college and then on to your career. It's a great skill to learn now. Step six, success and independence. Yay! You made it. You solved your problem. You can move on to the next stage. Good job. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a bit more about how to advocate for yourself. I think there were some great steps given in that video and here are some other ways that you can go about advocating for yourself. So the first part of this is plan. Um, I'm someone who really likes planning and I think planning ahead when advocating for yourself when possible, possible is really important. Uh, it's important to think about what advocating for yourself will look like and what steps you wanna take so that it can be as effective as possible. And the next part is prioritize. So work on prioritizing your needs. Uh, ask yourself what would be the most helpful for you uh, and how you can put yourself first in this situation. Next, boundaries. We talked a bit about boundaries today. So determine what boundaries you need. Take the time to think about what will be most helpful for you and then communicate those expectations with other people. And that goes into the next one, which is expressing yourself. When you're expressing yourself, be clear, calm, and firm. Uh, make sure that you're heard. Make sure that you've said everything you want to say and your needs will be met. And then finally, the last part of this is self-assurance. Uh, so it's important when you're advocating for yourself to believe in yourself and working on finding ways to affirm your identity are ways that you can do that. Uh, working on feeling comfortable with your different identities uh, through maybe being in community with people who have similar identities or taking part in cultural or religious practices that make you feel close to your identity can help you feel self-assured and have the confidence um, to advocate for yourself. Another tip sometimes for self-assurance or working on having the confidence to advocate for yourself can be using different tools like positive affirmations that can be helpful to finding that confidence to ask for what you need. All right, so next we wanted to go ahead and do a jam board. So if you've never done one of these before, Basically, what we'll do is I'll go ahead and drop this link in the chat and you can click on it. You can also scan the QR code or type the link into your browser and you'll go ahead and answer this question by putting a sticky note or some text on the board. One response on there is ask questions. I think that's absolutely a great answer. It's a great way to advocate for yourself. Make sure that you're understanding. Someone else said, letting teachers know when you're feeling overwhelmed. Absolutely, yeah, sometimes academic pressure can be a lot. It can be hard to tell your professors what you need. Knowing your boundaries, setting boundaries, telling people when my social battery is up. Absolutely, I'm not being scared to ask for what I need when it comes to work and school. Definitely, I think those are two places where it can be difficult to set boundaries. Uh, defend your values and beliefs, for sure. That's a great way to advocate for yourself and your needs. As someone else said, and not argue with people who just want to debate and not learn. 
yeah, knowing when and how to spend your energy and how, what conversations you want to put effort into and what conversations aren't necessarily worth that effort. Don't always have to be a people pleaser. You can always say no. Absolutely saying no is something that's really difficult to do, but so important and understanding that you don't necessarily have to, you know, go out of your way and you shouldn't uh, compromise your needs for someone else's. Take the time you need to rest. Absolutely, rest is so important. Maintain yourself grounded and keep your values, definitely. Going to protests, for sure, absolutely. Enforcing boundaries and being transparent about when you need support, definitely. These are, are all great answers. Thank you all so much. Someone else said one step of courage. Oh, it got covered up. I'll read that in a second. Be patient with yourself when advocating for yourself. Definitely, you know, give yourself grace. This isn't an easy thing to do. So be compassionate with yourself. Give yourself the time uh, that you need. Plan what you want to say and exactly what you want to communicate for the outcome you want to achieve. Yeah, that's something I found super helpful is sometimes I'll even write out what I want to say beforehand so I know what I'm trying to communicate if it's something that's difficult to do in the moment. One step of courage is much needed to stick to your values. Absolutely, yeah. Canceling plans when I don't feel good, definitely. I think canceling plans has a lot of, you know, stigma around it. And sometimes we feel bad for canceling plans, but it's okay to recognize that sometimes you just don't have the mental or physical energy to do something. And it's okay to reschedule and do it another time if that's what you need. Uh, one more says, determine what you need to prioritize. Oh, sleeping in whenever you can. Determine what you need to prioritize and complete beforehand. That can help create boundaries. Absolutely, both of those are fantastic answers. Sleep is so important. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go back and we'll wrap up the presentation. But again, thank you so much for your responses and definitely read other people's get ideas um, and keep using this for sure. Uh, so this is the sources that we used in our presentation. You can scan that QR code and that'll take you to a Google Doc with all the sources that we used for today's presentation. You can also type the tiny URL into your browser. We wanted to share some upcoming events with you all. So this week, um, tomorrow, Friday, um, maybe you know someone or you yourself are a student artist and your artwork relates to social justice, um, you can submit um, at that time you are link or at the QR code. So I'm talking about the flyer all the way on the right side um, or let your friends know if they're interested and they can get their art featured in the Cross-Cultural Center in the physical space, um, week seven, eight, nine, and 10. Uh, next week, we have two workshops coming up. So on Tuesday, we have a linguistic justice workshop um, where you can learn about the role that language plays in systems of power and how that has manifested in the appropriation of African-American vernacular English, also known as AAVE. And we also have a social justice mentorship program info session on Wednesday, May 4th. Uh, so if you want to learn about our the Cross-Cultural Center's alum, Alumni Roots Mentorship Program, or you want to gain access to social justice-minded alumni, um, you can um, join our Hug or Help Us Grow program. Um, so make sure to check all those events out. And thank you so much for your responses on the Jamboard and for participating in all of our discussion questions. If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to us at our email, which is cccenter at ucsd.edu. Or you can also check out our website at ccc.ucsd.edu. Um, and or you can check us out on Instagram, which is UCSD Cross Cultural Center. We're super active on there. All of our upcoming events get posted on there. And in addition to that, we post a whole bunch of informational blogs uh, pertaining to social justice, um, as well as blogs that our student interns write. So if you want to get to know 
Reese and I a little bit more or some of the other interns a little bit more, you can check that out. And thank you so much uh, to everyone for attending and that about wraps up our webinar today. Thank you so much. We're so glad y'all are here today.